So, a few of you may remember that I asked for questions regarding what you would like to hear in a bit of a talking format a while ago on my Instagram. In terms of response, I overwhelmingly had people asking about injuries while stretching. How do they happen? Why do they happen? What do we do when they do happen? How do we recover? What's the short term? What's the medium term? What's the long term? Uh, I was going to do this myself, but fortunately I'm in Australia visiting my good friend Kit Lockton, who Brother by um, mother. has a wealth of knowledge on this exact situation as well as myself. So we're just going to have a bit of a chat about this whole situation today and hopefully you learn something from it. So Kit, how's things? Good. We should also, I suppose at the outset, say that both of us have injured ourselves multiple times and yeah. no amount of theoretical understanding will ever trump that physical experience. Exactly. So fortunately we're both well, well versed. Well versed in messing in, in ourselves injury. up for in, your enjoyment. Well versed in injury, <laughs> well versed in how to manage those injuries because we're, yeah. still, we're still doing the same things that we've been doing for a long time, right? Yeah. So, and we expect to be doing them for a long time more. Indeed. So, uh, so. If I was to ask you a question, Kit, what would you say is the main cause of injuries in the gym, in stretching practice? Now, we're going to ignore catastrophic injuries. Yes, and but yes, let's ignore catastrophic injuries, and those catastrophic injuries we can, use, we can sum up generally as the person who experiences the catastrophic injury is unable to control the impact or the speed of the or, movement yeah, being the engaged acceleration or, 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 or is actually impacted by another mass yeah. like a body. So let's, we'll ignore those completely and let's just let's confine ourselves in this little chat to only stretching injuries. Yeah. The number one cause of stretching injuries is your ego is running the show, not the body. And by that yeah. I mean you know, let's say, well, I know, let's say, you say, I can do front splits, I've got perfect front splits, I'm just working on getting my hips perfectly square. You go into the, the session, you warm up in the normal way that you warm up, whatever that means. I personally don't believe in warming up, as you know. Yeah. But let's say you warm up and you think, okay, now it's time for front splits. And while thinking about the idea of the front splits that you can do, <coughs> you ease into that position or you drop yourself into that position, you're engaged in the doing of the thing that you're doing, but you're actually interacting with your conceptual understanding of it or your image or the image in your mind of what your splits look like or the idea, again an image usually for most people, or it could be a word that I can do side splits or front splits, I'm the person that can do that and I demonstrate my flexibility all the time. But on this particular occasion, instead of having your awareness on the sensations in the body as you actually get into the position and to pull a muscle can take literally a split second it can take a tenth of a second of too much tension or i would say tenth of a second where you're not able to relax quickly enough yeah. same thing for an injury to occur and whenever you ask someone uh well, ha well you you can do a pancake you can do front split side splits so how did you injure yourself well you know i felt a bit tight today but i, I thought i'd just push through it push mm -hmm. through. Pushing through is where the mind's idea trumps or dominates, trumps is a good word in this these <laughs> days, trumps the actual experience where the body is saying no no not today or not so far or not so quickly because sometimes as you know if you just slow the speed of the entry down a bit you can let everything go soft and you yeah. can go into it. Definitely agree on that one where just to explain it my own way is that my observation is it's generally the more advanced people or the people who have a longer practice Definitely. than the beginners who end up getting injured in positions because like Kit says you have I've seen this so many times particularly with the aerialists that we train around not so much the contortionists who mm -hmm. they're massively flexible but they would come in they would do whatever prep or warm up they were doing that day and then things weren't feeling tight so instead of accepting that we are not living in a linear progression society and things will Things are never going to be stable. Everything is always changing. You're going to be good some days, bad some other days, whatever it is. But they'll come in and go, oh, I normally have a 30 centimeter oversplit. They'll come in and they're feeling really tight and they can't do their oversplit. And their go-to in ev almost every case was, ah, that's when I'll get someone to start pushing on me. That's when I'll get someone to grab some sandbags and try use some weight to push myself down. Hmm. Whereas in normal practice, you should think, okay, things are not working today. Things, you know, I'm tired. I'm dehydrated. I've had a rough night, a or big training session, whatever it is. Whatever it is. The primary datum here is the body is telling you it's not going to that position today. Yeah. 
So what do you do? You either accept that reality or you try to push past it. Yeah. Well, yeah. good luck with that. Exactly. Eventually you will hit the wall. So mm. I would say in most, I'd say in most stretching injuries, that's where I've encountered. It's very rare for beginners to get injured with me. I know it's been the exact same with you guys, yes. ANU and stretch therapy. Yes. But it is the people who, you know, when, I, when we say advanced, just to clear it up, we're not talking, you know, contortionists are advanced. We're talking about people who have a good long training history yes. and should be more aware, even if they, you know, I'll have people I consider advanced, but they haven't got full splits. But I should be trusting them, but they're the ones who will get themselves into trouble. Well, if Olivia were part of our conversation, she would tell you that the only people that hurt themselves at the ANU in the facility we ran there for, I think, 27 years, something like that. And we, in that time, we had something like 24, 25,000 students overall. We had lots yeah. of teachers teaching for us as well. It was only students in the advanced class that hurt themselves. And not, not that it was common. I don't want to give the impression yeah. that you know, people hurt themselves all the time. Uh, but I remember, here's a classic story. I remember a friend of mine um, who was doing pancake on this particular day. And this is a, a movement. So like Olivia, she's normally got legs apart, chest on the ground, you know, and just in, yeah. in full position, just that's her movement pattern. Yeah. It's not a stretch for her, in other words. But she bent down and she went into the pancake fairly quickly and she told me after class she felt this little pop right up high in the groin, yeah. just a little pop. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, and then for the next six months she could not move forward out of sitting upright with her legs apart. She couldn't move much more yeah. than this forward without that hurting quite intensely. And so that's something else we can talk about is actually length of injury. So yeah. after six months, but then Another night at the advanced class, she went into the pancake again, went into the same position, expecting it to hurt, and it didn't hurt. And she went all the way down to the floor and felt that little pop again. And about a week later, a little tiny bruise came out on this part of her thigh, right up here yeah. in one of the higher ductors, about that big, so the size of a five cent piece. It was there and gone, and she had perfect flexibility with no restrictions after that. So in saying this, I'm not saying that you need to tear things and repair them, but in, yeah. in fact, by accidentally tearing herself and then repairing that, but keeping on working on it, that's the way to have a full repair. And in fact, I never spoke about my own hamstrings, but you might recall that I had yeah. a problem with this hamstring and that lasted for two years. Mm -hmm. And now this is back to being my loosest leg. Yeah. But for two years, every time I tried to stretch the hamstrings, all, I've, all I experienced was very unpleasant, painful sensations. Basically, the body saying, don't do it, but I didn't stop doing the things that we do. So work on the other leg, all the other movement yeah. patterns and so on that we do. And what happens in time by constantly trying it, constantly trying it every week, at least once a week, I'd restretch yeah. and to see what it felt like. And then I think what actually was the, the, the main way past that problem for me and Olivia and I were both doing this at the same time is actually um, single leg um, Bulgarian deadlifts, so bent and straight lifts, single leg Bulgarian deadlifts, only with body weight or a very light yeah. um, kettlebell, two kilograms or something, but concentrating on the elongation phase and trying to retard the movement towards the floor. Yeah. And that puts the tension in the muscle and that helps all the fibers and the, the fascia in particular to straighten out. And then eventually, and this is the key thing, there was absolutely no difference on the day before when I was stretching my hamstrings and it was incredibly painful and just felt unpleasant and ugly and the next day when in fact it was completely better and it's been better ever since and that was eight months ago. Yeah. No transition. Yeah, that that's No one understands that I've but that is reality and I'm sure you've had Yeah, that. I've seen the exact same thing. I've experienced it myself. I've seen it with other people. There's a interesting thing that one, let's just cover the acute phase first. Yeah, sure. So say someone comes to UK, Kit, I've tweaked my hamstring, I've tweaked an adductor from stretching because I wasn't paying attention. As, <laughs> whatever. You know, whatever. Whatever the reason. <laughs> oh, you know, it's catastrophic. I slipped into splits while cleaning the kitchen. Well, I slipped, I slipped into splits once on the back steps of our place that we used to live in. It was an icy morning and I didn't see the ice on the steps. Yeah. So I really, literally, holding coffee, <laughs> Olivia heard this scream, this scream. I was staying in the Japanese tea house that night and just heard this scream and, and I... It was, the, it was the day I was heading off to a, a, a retreat in New Mexico. I <laughs> had a long plane flight in front of me. But yeah, it is possible to accidentally yeah. fall into splits. It is. Uh, like these things do happen, so we can ignore that. But someone comes and says, I've pulled the groin, I've pulled yeah. the hamstring. By that, we generally mean a grade one muscle tear or Same. grade one tear, but just for you science nerds out there. 
What do we do the first six weeks? Well, the first thing is I don't recommend ice and neither does traditional Chinese medicine, as you know, yeah. they recommend heat recommend always. Ice. And in my own body, personally, the, the application of ice onto an injured part has always felt, uh, the best word I can come up with is wrong. It just doesn't feel right. Yeah. I don't have the same thing, but heat on the other hand almost always feels excellent. Um, sometimes even wrapping a bandage around a pulled hamstring high up ne yeah. next to the glute can feel absolutely fantastic. Um, but keeping on moving. I'm not talking about stretching now. You've heard something, so that it's time to back off. You've yeah. actually you ignored the, the first, second, third, and fourth warning signs because you were paying attention to something else. So you've actually gone past that point and you hurt yourself. So I would recommend heat. I'd also recommend, if you know any skillful massage therapist, I'd also recommend getting work done on the part of the muscle that's not injured but still the same muscle group. Um, and that could include acupuncture too, if you know a, a skilled acupuncturist. And in my own body, the, the things that I've used, and I mentioned this before, but I'll, I'll mention it again now in this context, and that is some kind of stretching which is about more retarding the elongation rather than trying to stretch, if that makes yeah. sense. So basically what we call eccentric training. Eccentric and dynamic. Yeah. Um, so moving into a stretch momentarily and moving back out immediately. Yeah. Now in our system we call that pulsing, and you call it something else, or maybe I'd call you... it pulsing or ballistic. I kind of haven't really got a name, but it, look, it's a continuum, isn't yeah, it's it? Yeah. It's also people that associate pulsing with high speed. We'll explore that yeah. another yeah. time. That's a whole interesting area all by itself. But that's what I have found to be the most compatible in my own body. That feels the least threatening. It feels the most controllable. And because I have absolutely no desire to end my life in a wheelchair, I want to be mobile and do all the things that I can do. Plus, of course, we teach these things. I yeah. have to be able to do these things with that extra little push there. Um, every week to 10 days, in the case of a, a grade one, grade two injury, every week to two weeks, I'd go back to the exact same movement and expose myself to it to see what the actual reaction of the body is to it. If the body's reaction is frank fear yeah don't try to do anything with it but and it's as i said it took two years for my hamstring to come good that's a long time and mm -hmm. but then the day when you give the body the same challenge for want of a better word and it responds in a different way then you know you're off and running yeah you know that's two years is a very long time most hamstring injuries and adductor injuries the longest i've heard of um, apart from my own two-year experiences, somewhere between six months and a year. Now, what about you? I think it might think it took me ten years to get my flexibility back. We'll talk about that in a second. Well, no, that's but, it's very good to know that. But yeah. that, hey, but here's what I want to add, though. At that point, that did not stop you doing what you do. Yeah. For the whole of that ten years, right? No. So that's what. That's another thing that we need to impress upon people. It is an absolutely pathetic response to say, "I've injured myself. This is no good for me." Um, I'm not going to do it anymore, and then complain about how you can't do X, Y, or Z. You can do that if you want to, but it's not going to. It, it will. I absolutely guarantee you, it will not change anything for the better. Yeah. So. So you, just to go back to what. So just my approach on if someone comes to me with this stage of injury, just for people out there, Kit likes the eccentrics, which I've used from time to time. Hmm. What I really like, and now this is one of the ones that people do fuck up a lot. So just pay attention. Is I like isometrics just above the pain zone. So let's say my wrist is injured, I've pulled my mm -hmm. forearm for example, and let's say the pain comes on here. I'll back out about 20 degrees, and then I'll just apply gentle pressure through the hand to make the muscle contract. Now people always go too hard, too fast, and we'll hold those contractions for about 45 seconds. Now I'm talking, we don't want to max it out. 10% pressure is fine, 15%, 20%. You can work up slowly as an injury gets better. But you'll find doing these once a day, twice a day at most, just one set, really does help oh, look, speed up the pain. Look, going every away. time you say something, and it's really annoying to hear you say this, I realise that both Olivia and I do exactly the same thing, but we just haven't codified it. We yeah. haven't said, this is one of the techniques you pull out of the, the tool bag. But I was watching Olivia do something today, and and... It's basically putting the body in a position, so let's say, I mean, I'm making this up, yeah. and you're just exploring what that feels like and stay there. Contract it a bit, that's what I'm doing now, you can't see it, I'm contracting this muscle back here. And very slow to go a bit further, what does it feel like? And on a day when it's not going to go any further, it'll say stop. Yeah. You've got to listen. 
And when yeah. it says stop, guess what? You, you have stop. to stop. <laughs> and this is the thing, like, this is the, yes. the danger of using movement to help with stretching injuries or any kind of mobility based injuries. Yes. Is it's a double edged sword. It's great, but you have to go, okay, I was working on this progression here, but now I have to step back a progression, yes. two progressions, regress it to a level that you can do it, achieve roughly the same iteration or a back backpedaling whatever position we're working on, but then we can work on it in a way that doesn't hurt. This is incredibly important because what happens after our six weeks, when all the tissue damage should be fixed, theoretically, think, yep. then why does the pain remain? This is one of these things. It does, and the, the pain remains for a number of different reasons, but all the proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors information in the muscles, um, muscular tendon, its intersections and yeah. so on, they're all received in a part of the brain called the somatosensory cortex, as you know. And the somatosensory cortex has a perfect map of all the things that you can do with your body, which is why we can close our eyes, hopefully, and touch our nose with our fingertips, right? Because we, we, know, we know exactly what that thing is. Now, at a much more subtle level, the body knows exactly its capacities in all things, and so this is why someone who's not a stretching person will watch someone go into the slits and their whole body will just recoil, oh, fuck, I can't do that. Yeah. Uh, they, 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 without even trying it, they will know, they'll tell you, oh, I know, I, I can't do that. That yeah. certainty is very, that's clarity. It is clear and it's, and it's probably accurate and partly it's because there's a belief there that you can't do it. Yeah. So getting back to the actual injury that you were talking about, the, your flexibility is nothing more than a constantly evolving map of what the mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors are telling the brain that you can do. And so all the things that you can't do are part of that map. Mm -hmm. And so we like to say, Basically, when you when you go outside the known world, if I can put it that yeah. way, if you step outside the known world into the unknown world, the body's primary, and this is hardwired in the system, and all living things are wired this way. If you poke an amoeba with a a, 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 pro, a probe, it will recoil from yeah. it, and so the fear response is about recoiling, protecting, and withdrawing from the thing that creates that yeah. response. Pain is no, and pain and an injury is nothing more than that, just strengthened. Mm -hmm. And so unless you actually change the shape of the map, and the only way, it, well, I should say, the cr crucial thing to understand is this map is created only by mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors information. Yeah. So you have to change the shape of the map and the experience of the map by actually doing the things which up until now have been horrifying or terrifying or whatever. And so for an injury, until you stress that part past the point that before caused that injury, the brain will not trust that part. Mm -hmm. And person, if some, you'll be working with someone and, and you'll be saying, you're looking a little bit you know, worried here, and the person will always say, yes, I'm worried about pulling that thing. I've had that injury there for years, or I pulled that hamstring before, or those adductors you injured, for example. I'm worried about those, and the worry increases the tension yes. in the muscles and makes the injury more likely. So it's a vicious Yeah, this is one of those things because we have, we have the raw sensory information going from the muscle group, yes. whatever, to the brain. And then our pain in some ways, our interpretation of what is Absolutely. going on. It is. And then people get attached at a subconscious level to, I bend forward, touch my toes, pain occurs. So then the expectation of this pain occurring makes the pain occur. Well, it's a negative feedback loop. Yeah. Um, and what we are hopeless at, and human beings are very self-protective yeah. by nature, and also we're intelligent and we can reflect on things and project into the future. Yeah. So it's not just a simple, um, a single reflex at all, it's actually doing work on the experience which then ramps up the fear response or the pain response and yet nothing's actually changed cellularly yeah. or in any other way in the body. This is very real. And so, and so we say this to our students all the time, we must contrive over time to re-experience the original phenomenon that caused the injury with full awareness and for that not to actually have that effect and then, and this is amazing, you cannot remember that pain again. Once yeah. that experience has passed, you can't bring it back into your mind. You try to think of yeah. the injuries you've had and you think, hey, Mr. God, why, why, why don't I can't actually bring that back. Yeah. So the thing is this, it's an unfolding thing constantly and once you've actually gone past that point, that experience, that event into this territory where the stress is actually greater than what caused the original injury, the whole system relaxes. Yeah. And your experience is, oh, I used to have that hamstring injury and I don't anymore. Yeah. That's um, the, it's 
But I can say it's almost universal with these long persisting things. It is like a switch going off. Yes. I've had the exact same thing. So for those who don't know, I've spoken about this a bit online. I had both my adductors torn with grade two tears at the same time by, I was doing a middle split on yoga blocks. And one of the coaches in circus school just slammed me into the ground or tried to. Now, knowing my hip structure at the time, or how it is now, I shouldn't. I don't have a hip that is capable of a over middle split. Mm -hmm. I didn't know better. It was nineteen. And you know what, everyone watching out there, full middle splits is just a beautiful thing all by itself. Yeah, that's all you need anyway. Mm. But I got slammed, and like from this person putting contact on me and weight, mm -hmm. and me not even. I didn't even know. I'd say if I'd known, I could have handled it or digested it better. Yes, or you but could have actually braced yourself I could have even braced in that position. Yeah. Mount might be able to push you past that Maybe point. kind of like. Whatever, we can go on this, but that's what happened. I contracted in response to this and pop, pop. Now, yeah, we should explain something here. It's actually the involuntary um, stretch reflex under yeah. tension which causes the tear, not the actual force that the guy applied to you necessarily. Yeah. The muscles actually tear themselves. Yeah. Uh, th and that's true for hamstrings. We were talking about yeah, that another time. We talked about hamstrings, yeah. yeah. So, what happened for me after this is I had mm. the physio in circuit school, so. Just to clarify, it's not the physio James Wellington who's there now, who's fantastic. I just don't want to end up putting him in the shit. But the physio they had at the time in Circus Space was... Who will remain nameless. Who will remain nameless, yes. Uh, a good-hearted human being, no doubt, loved yeah, by yeah, his yeah, mother. Yeah. No, it was, it was someone who had the, all the best intentions, but a bit out of depth. Yep. That's fine. But their advice was like, oh, you've torn your thing. You must keep stretching it and re-tearing it. No. Now, I follow this being a bit stupid not paying attention to what I was feeling in my body. Well, just stop so, there for a second. Now, there's more operating there than yeah. what you're saying. It wasn't, the, it, it was actually an authority figure told you that. Yeah. And so if you do, and it, it's a very human thing to do this, and particularly when you're in a hierarchical situation like that, it's absolutely normal when an authority figure, when someone who you trust in particular says, keep on doing this, at the very least, you suspend disbelief. Yeah. Right. Even if your own body is saying no, 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 I say again, no. You know, yeah. Cyrano de Bergerac style. Even if it says that, you're still inclined to go with that. Yeah. yeah and I can tell you from watching um, sumo wrestlers train in Japan, um, a couple of big guys will get on those ten-year-old kids and twelve-year-old kids, and they will literally push them into side splits, and they do tear them again and again and again. And that what they say is, if you survive that training, you will have perfect side splits all of your life, and that is true. You do. Oh, sure will. But, but, but how many survive it? The attrition is very high. The attrition rate is very high. And we, we believe, both of us believe, yeah. that it's completely unnecessary to do that. You can still have advanced flexibility without those tearing things. Yeah, right? definitely. But anyway, so I kept, particularly on the right side, the left side healed up. It took about a year. The right side, because I kept tearing it and re-experiencing this injury, constantly got to the point where it just wouldn't, going legs apart, would have a... Uh, as I got more to know myself better, I began to, I'd, even the thought of trying a pancake or a side split would kick off the involuntary fear response. No, 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 you, you ought to repeat that because that's, that's gold. The thought of the movement was enough to kick off the fear response and also those yeah. same muscles would be contracting to their... The yeah, yeah, I can feel like... It's it. the whole recalling response. No, no, yeah. no. Yes. So this was like, I didn't know much as I do about functional neurology, but this is like, it embedded the pattern of pain. Very deeply. In there, to the point where like, the scar tissue was also very immense after these multiple, multiple tearings. Sure. I probably tore it another 12 times that year trying to get past it. Just a bit stupid in hindsight, but we do these things. Hmm. And then, because this pattern of pain and fear was built in so much, it took a long time. Now what it took was the novel stimulus of ballistic stretching, so I took the pulsing stretch, remember when we were in the forum a while ago, mm -hmm. we had the big phase where everyone was mm -hmm. experimenting again. Mm -hmm. But it took that of doing it on a different plane in a very similar, but not as extended motion as the side split, that it gave me this novel sensation of moving in this area without pain. That's the goal. The experience of moving in the direction or the region without pain, that changes the experience. That changes it. And then it happened, now it kind of, like that adductor lady, the pain kicked off much worse than my scar tissue. I was like, okay, I need to give this a break. So I gave it a break for about a month or two. And then I came back and I was just testing my side splits. And then I was paying attention, or I wasn't really paying attention. I was like, oh, nothing's happening. So then I was kind of like, okay, what do I feel now? And I was like, hold on, the pain and fear is gone. 
I don't but, actually feel what I expect. Yeah, to I feel. don't feel what I expect to feel. Now when I do my side splits, it's uh, it's kind of at this fluctuation stage where it's flat and not flat anymore. Well, I was watching you do side splits yeah, a moment see, ago. They look fantastic. Yeah. Way better than when we met, which was only... That was at like the tail end of ago. the injury. That was about five years ago now. That long? Yeah. How time flies when you're having fun. I know. <laughs> so, yeah, so for me, it was like providing a novel, a new movement I'd never done before in a plane that was kind of similar, that gave my body going, hold on. It's not the side split, because if I said side split then, it still would have kicked off. Sure. But I'd done something that was very side split like. Yes. Well, uh, we, we did something else, yeah. both Oliver and I, for different reasons, were playing with something else. Um, I got myself an Olympic barbell set, yeah. you know, again, as you do. And I, I Boys and his toys. Boys and their toys. Um, but I realised, or I remembered, I should say, that uh, my Romanian deadlifts were particularly strong compared to my normal deadlifts. Yeah. Um, I've done. In the Romanian deadlift, I've done uh, five reps on 140, for example. Yeah. Um, which is a fairly heavy Romanian deadlift. Yeah. But but that the mechanics for that movement are in my body, and I remembered that. So part of the hamstring recovery process I went through, and this didn't hurt the hamstring at all. In fact, it gave me, I think, possibly it, it contributed something like the same experience you were talking about. Once I got up to, I think, in this recent cycle, I got up to 100 kilo Romanian deadlifts. So not 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 heavy, not heavy but, heavy, but still good. But still reasonable, and I was also very aware that I was using that hamstring to do that, and it felt good. Yeah. And all of these things, that and not exceeding what it was telling me it was capable of doing over that two-year period, those two things together is what created that situation where one day it just felt right, and it's, it's felt excellent ever since. Yeah, it's very interesting. I had a, another girl yeah. contact me, so I work. I refer people to this physio called David McGettigan who is, he does voodoo as far as I'm concerned. Voodoo, I but like that. He, there was one girl who contacted me, who was just like, my, I injured my hamstring, I can't remember exactly how she'd done it, but my pike was normally fantastic. I checked her Instagram and it was very, very good pike, mm -hmm. like for high level. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I haven't been able to sit on the floor with my leg straight since this injury. But it'd been going on a year. Yeah. So I said, go to David. His whole thing is basically working with mechanoreceptors. Mm -hmm. That's his whole thing is how that providing no novel stimulus and experience mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. He went in. He made the girl do some movements. He done some of his voodoo. Bam! The pike is instantly fixed. Oh look! Okay, so thanks for reminding me. Here's another example yeah. of an instant fix of a pike. Olivia, you know Olivia's flexibility is yeah, yeah. excellent. But when we were working, and I can't remember how long ago this was, probably, I don't know, three years ago, but oh, that's probably wrong, some time ago. Yeah. She was sitting forward in a pike on the floor and holding her feet, and her back was sort of something like that. So I'd say rounded spine and about 45 degrees from vertical. Yeah. So nowhere near a pike. And so I said, where do you feel that? She said, I feel that in my hamstring. I'm thinking to myself, I know what this girl's hamstrings are like. They're fantastically yeah. loose. And so, and I don't know where I got the idea from, but I just had a bit of a feel around of her back, and I could feel that the that the fascia here over her yeah. middle back, when I tried to move the skin and fascia with my hands, it was stuck yeah. on the muscles below. And I thought, oh, fuck, that's interesting. I wonder what would happen if I did this. So I did some friction massage along the line, the longitudinal line. I did some cross work until, and I used both hands and pulled the skin apart, until I could move the skin yeah. in all directions on the muscles underneath, and she went slam straight down into a perfect pike, face on shins, back almost straight. And her experience was her hamstrings had let go. Yeah. Well, of course, the fascial body, the whole the superficial fascia, it's all one thing, right? And so that's something else to consider, and it could be that your your voodoo guy has has uh, clicked into this. You might ask him yeah, next time and see whether... He teaches the whole system of positional tendon, PTD, or I can't remember the full acronym. Don't they love acronyms? Yeah, it's some acronym. But I've sent so many people to him, but it's this giving people something new for their body to digest. I see, so that's And helping take the fear out. Yeah, to experience that's the position without the fear changes the experience, as I said before. Or the before expectation of pain. Absolutely. He's also very good at like the pain science side of the thing of, you know, educate, if we educate people of the nature of their injury, yeah. then the injury will seem less worse. If you tell someone like, you've torn your hamstring, you'll never walk again. Well, that, I mean, you know I've done a lot of research yeah. in this area. I won't go into the details of it, but that, that process is called nocebo, which is yeah. Latin for I hurt, and it's the opposite of placebo, which is um, Latin for I please. Yeah. Um, so those, 
those effects are in no way subtle. They can be enormously powerful. Yeah. When some authority figure shows you, let's say an MRI which shows the tissue damage and says you'll never walk again because of X, Y, or Z, um, then a fraction of the population will adopt what a medical anthropologist called Conrad called the sick role, yeah. and they will never recover. Yeah. It's... That's it. Game over. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very interesting. It's very powerful. It almost like it almost strays into the line of hypnotherapy. Well, it but does. It does. Also, like there's one thing that kind of spoke me. I'm sure you've got a lot to say on, but we are running out of time. Mm. Uh, I'll get you started on we this. We should. Well, we'll do this again, yeah, and we'll, we'll do, do it by again. Skype when you're. But this one, because it came up with me, is I know you're a Buddhist, and I'm sure other people do. Yeah. Is people get attached to the form what is presented to them? of their injury or giving this form that you are the patient, you become attached to the role of the patient, mm -hmm. and then suddenly that becomes a lot of your suffering, I suppose. It, 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 well, it, the, the process is this, it becomes yeah. your identity first. Yeah. Right? I am the one who has back pain or whatever yeah. it is. Um, and then the ego gets involved to protect, <coughs> to protect that identity. It is so sneaky. It's, it's so sneaky. sneaky. So. Yeah, you got to be, that's why we have to watch what's actually happening in our own minds um, all the time if we're interested in growing because I would say 95% of the stuff your mind throws up at you is nonsense anyway yeah. and, and if we're actually hooked into <coughs> believing that what the mind is giving us is actually true, um, our doom is assured, to be honest, yeah. it really is. So I'm going to stop you there because... We are reaching the end of our talk. Can you? We'll just we'll we'll just ask the person who's observing, please, to put the scent of the camera that shows the two of us to line. Okay. If it is already. Brilliant. Okay. Well, so, look, thank you. Just and uh, first off, thank you, Kit. Oh no, thank so, you. Thanks. A great talk. I hope all of you guys learned something. I just need to plug this. So, Kit and Olivia have just recorded. <sighs> what they call absolute beginner stretching. Now, I've seen a couple of samples of it, and when they say absolute beginners, they literally mean people who have never stretched before and feel lost and maybe go that. Or all the people that you know who say, I know I should stretch, I, but I don't know how to start, or I know I should be doing more stretching, where they've got that idea from, who knows, it's yeah. probably some chiropractor or someone. Yeah. Anyway, it's for people to begin at the very beginning with. Yeah, and it's one of those things we always we teach the flashy stuff in some ways. We yeah. splits and pancakes. But there is a lot of people who are probably listening to this, even your parents, if you're a bit younger around yes. my age, who probably go, I feel tight, I'd like to stretch more, I don't know what to do. Well, look, I'm, I'm ancient, I'm a pensioner now. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm 65, I think, uh, at least chronologically, but it, it, my body doesn't work that way. So, yeah, we, we commend this to you. Yeah. And we will definitely pick up a part two and a part three on this because, honestly, we have only scratched the surface on yeah. this. Cool. Anyway, thanks, Kit, so much. No, it's a pleasure, man. And oh, thank you all for listening. Thanks, Olivia, and thanks, Elisa.